Joshua 6, where the Lord told Joshua to march around the city and take dominion of that. And so that's what we're going to do today. You make the blind man see. You make the lame man walk again. You cause the dead to rise. And that's why we dance in liberty. Because you do it all again.
Can you help me say my, my God? as we celebrate communion together. It's one of our traditions here at Converge Church that the first Sunday of each month, can you believe it's already May, y'all, of 2022, five months in, and God is already doing amazing things. You know, in biblical numerology, the number five represents grace, unmerited favor, God's hand upon our lives to enable us to do things that we cannot do for ourselves. I just pray that for you and yours this morning, that you will experience an outpouring of the grace of God upon your life, 
and upon everything that you set your hands to in the places where men have said this is impossible the grace of God upon you will declare it is possible the scripture declares that on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took the cup or he took the bread and said this is my body which is broken for you and as often as you eat it you do it in remembrance of me listen our God was so big that he gave his son Jesus that he would bear the weight of the world upon his shoulders. That's a big God. That's a strong God. That's a mighty God. He carried the weight for us when we couldn't do it for ourselves. So Lord, this morning, we celebrate your broken body, your body that was broken for us so that we could win in every, every area of our lives. We thank you that this emblem of your broken body is blessed to our bodies and our lives to your service. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Take now and eat. Thank you, Lord. And the scriptures testify saying that on that same night, Jesus didn't only take the bread, but he also took the cup. And he said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. And as often as you drink this cup, you do it in remembrance of me. Lord, in this moment, we remember what you did for us. That not only was your body broken, but your blood was shed. That precious blood that will never lose its power. And Lord, in that blood, we find healing. We find health, we find redemption. Father, we find forgiveness of all our sins. For your word declares in 1 John 1 and 9 that if we confess our sins, God, you are faithful and you are just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So now, as we drink the cup, we thank you for what your shed blood made possible. That now we can have communion and fellowship with a loving God because of the finished work of the cross. We thank you that this symbol of your shed blood is blessed to our bodies and our lives to your service. In Jesus' name, take now and drink. Amen. Father, we thank you for your great love wherewith you've loved us for your mercies that are new every morning, even this moment. We thank you for your steadfast love that never ceases. Your mercies that never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And this morning we declare that you're worthy. Worthy of all our praise, worthy of all the glory, worthy of all the honor. And you will always always both now and forever be the lamb that was slain for our redemption we thank you for it we rest in it we celebrate it now in jesus name and everyone said and amen let's continue in this atmosphere and attitude of worship together as the team leads us in worship
The name that you say and things change, atmospheres shift. That is King Jesus. And that is who humbled himself as a man and walked this earth. And so Father God, we thank you for what you're doing in this place, for what you're doing in each and every individual's lives. Father God, we know that you reign. And we just sing worthy, worthy, worthy is your name. You are worthy to be praised. No matter what our situation looks like, no matter if you never do anything for us again, you've already done it all. God, we thank you for the gospel. God, we thank you for who you are. God, we worship you for your attributes. Not because of what we receive, not because of what you do here on this earth, but for who you are. Can we sing that one more time? Just the chorus. Said, worthy is your name. Come on, lift it up. Converge Live, our in-person worship experience. We also want to say hello and welcome to Converge Nation, who is tuning in via live stream today, you guys. That is such a big deal. So yes, let's make Converge Nation feel welcome and as much a part of the family as they are. If you are here with us for the first time in person, we also want to say welcome to you too. Thank you so much for joining us. We do appreciate it. We realize that you have many choices and so it is not lost on us that you choose to spend this time with us today to celebrate your first time with us we do ask that you would stop by the welcome center at the end of the worship experience we have a gift for you it's a token of appreciation and just our small way of saying thank you so much for choosing to be here amen amen so guys there are a few things that are happening that we want to make you aware of and the best way to stay informed on everything that is happening right here at converge everything that God is doing in and through Converge is to connect with us on our social media platforms. You can find and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at We Are Converge. And we are happy to share that you can also find us on TikTok at Converge Church. So be sure to like our pages, be sure to follow, be sure to take advantage of the amazing content that we have on demand for you guys. It's there for you. Okay? Thank you. Next Sunday, May 8th, is Mother's Day. And so we will be having a special message from our very own Pastor Wendy. Yes, we are excited for that. We understand, yes, it's Mother's Day and we're going to celebrate our moms, but we understand that there may be families where you don't 
your mom's not with us anymore or you know what what have you so we want to make sure that you understand this message is not just going to be for women it's not just going to be for mothers please come and join us it is going to be a message that is universal and that touches everyone's lives don't let that stop you from coming we want you to join us here today Next up, on Sunday, May 15th, we are having Graduation Sunday. Yes, so if you are connected with Converge as a member and you are graduating from high school or from college, we want to celebrate this milestone with you. We ask that you would connect with us via um, email at admin at weareconverge. We're asking for a few details. We need your full name. We need you to send in your senior pick or a headshot. We need to know what high school you're graduating from, what college you're going to, as well as your intended major. And then if you're graduating from college, tell us what college you're graduating from, as well as the degree that you are obtaining. So make sure you send all that information to admin at We Are Converge and come out and join us because our very own Coquetso Makafola, our student ministries director, will be bringing a on-time message for our graduates. All right? Thank you, guys. So. As we move forward into the Bless Life segment of our worship experience, thank you so much, T. Roz. Thank you, thank you. This is our opportunity to help move forward the vision and the mission that God has given us here at Converge in our giving. So if you would like to partner with us financially, we have multiple ways that you can do that. First, here in person, our ushers are in the aisles with envelopes and ink pens. I forgot mine at my seat, but that's okay. You guys grab one, fill it out in its entirety. We ask that you would do that so that we can properly record and account for your giving. You can also give online safely and securely by visiting us at weareconverge.com forward slash give. You can give via text by texting Converge Give along with a dollar amount to 77977 and you can give via our mobile app. You just search the iOS and the Android platforms to find and download Converge Church Plano. So as you guys are giving, let's have a quick word of prayer before we move forward. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for this day that you have made. We choose to rejoice and be glad in it. We are thankful unto you, and we bless your name. We thank you for this opportunity to give and to sow into the kingdom here at Converge to help deliver the messages that you give us, to help the people that you've called us to, and to do everything that you have asked us to do here at Converge, all for your glory and all to reach your people. We love you, God. We appreciate this opportunity to sow into the good ground here at Converge. We do not take it lightly. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. We appreciate your generosity and everything you do to make life-giving ministry happen here at Converge. Enjoy the rest of the worship experience. In the midst of uncertainty, our faith can struggle. Our walk becomes labored, our heart heavy. There's something about the unknown which seems to weaken us. It drains our patience and blurs our focus. Yet in the middle of everything stands a faithful God a God who's not swayed by the struggle, who isn't moved by the winds of chaos, a God who remains faithful even when our faith is fragile. It seems more difficult than ever to not worry about tomorrow, yet that's exactly what God has asked us to do. For when we cast our burdens on Him, the troubles of the moment begin to fade. When we trust the plans he has for us, our fear begins to subside. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, our focus becomes consumed by clarity. Yes, we are in the midst of uncertainty, but we can be certain of one thing, God is faithful, and that is more than enough for tomorrow.
Yeah. Anyone else ready for the word this morning? Awesome, awesome. Welcome to Converge Live right here at 1611 Wilmoth Road, which is becoming the new home of Converge Church. Come on, listen. And we want to welcome you also joining us via live stream, not rebroadcast, but live stream. So let's show our love to everyone joining us virtually from around the city, from around the great state of Texas, from around the nation, and from around the world. We welcome you uh, to our worship experience. We're so excited uh, that you've joined us this morning in person and online. We're going to dive into the word momentarily. But before I do that, I would be remiss if I didn't say a big thank you to everyone who participated in our, uh, our ask, right? So on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, uh, there were two appeals. Uh, the first one was to serve the Taylor family who were recently involved in a house fire. They lost their home in a house fire. And uh, you guys responded generously uh, and uh, with about $1,300 uh, that will go directly to the Taylor family to help them as they transition. Also, uh, Dima Bondarenko uh, was in our service and he is preparing to head to, to uh, Ukraine. Uh, to join his brothers and sisters there. Uh, you know everything that's happening there. But not only that, Dima reached out to me uh, earlier this week, and he was supposed to be in this service, but I think something came up. Uh, but he was going to be in this service uh, with us this morning uh, because not only is he returning to the Ukraine, uh, uh, President Biden, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, green-lighted a program that allows a 1,000 Ukrainians to resettle in the U.S., well, one of the families uh, 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 is now with Dima. Dima drove down to the U.S.-Mexico border. It's a mom and her two children, uh, Olga, uh, Dominic, and Amelia. And they were going to be in the service this morning. I'm sure something came up. Uh, but, uh, but Dima drove down to the border, brought them back. And it's interesting that the program closed on Wednesday, and they made it to Mexico on, I think, Sunday. And so uh, they will be resettling right here in McKinney. In fact, the kids have already been registered for school. Dominic is in middle school. Uh, Amelia is in high school. And, uh, and, and Dima had one ask. He said, listen, Pastor Ray, while I'm gone, will you let Converge be this family's new church home? And so we're going to love on them and we're gonna care for them uh, while they're here in McKinney. All of that's possible because of your kindness, your compassion, and your generosity. And we've said this from day one, here at Converge Church, we live with an open hand, not a clenched fist, amen? And we show our faith, not by our words, but by our works. And so that's the kind of church God has called us to be, where three things, we prioritize three things, right? You'll hear us say it often, Jesus, people, and purpose. Because everywhere you find Jesus in the text, he was ministering to people and pointing them to their purpose. And that's where the name Converge comes from. Because if we follow Jesus, there will always be a convergence of people and purpose. Amen? And so we're becoming the kind of church where Christ and culture intersect. Glory to God. Amen. Well, I'm excited. Uh, we're going to dive into the Word. Uh, I was joking with our leadership team because during our pre-service huddle, we went through our run sheet. And according to the run sheet, this service is supposed to end at 1115. Come on, somebody. Oh, ye of little faith. Pray for your pastor. It is 1040. I think we can make it happen in 38 minutes or less. In Jesus' name. Y'all just looking at me like, uh, no. Let's pray and we'll dive into the word together. Amen. Father, we come to you in the strong name of Jesus. And we thank you for your precious holy word. I thank you, Lord, that your word will never return unto you void or empty. It will always prosper in the thing where unto it is sent. So this morning, as we speak your word, as we declare your word, we thank you that faith rises in our hearts to lay hold of everything that you have promised and purposed for us individually and corporately in Jesus' name. And everyone said, 
Amen and amen. Listen, this morning I'm going to revisit a series of messages uh, that we, 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 we uh, I guess, uh, examined at the beginning of the year. We did a series called There Is More. I felt that there was at least one more message in my heart regarding our anchor text for this year, which is lifted from Luke chapter number five. It was more than just a series of messages. In fact, it is the sort of the, 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 the passage of scripture that's going to guide us as a church this year. Luke chapter five, uh, beginning at verse number one. We felt this impression as we sought the Lord at the end of last year that the word for this year is simply there is more. Ah, y'all missed an opportunity to get really excited. Listen, there is more that God wants to do in you, for you, and through you this year. Yeah, that's good news. God wants to do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything and everything you could ever ask or imagine. That means if you can ask it, if you can imagine it, God not only wants to do more, God will do more. In fact, uh, since the beginning of the year, we've invited our leadership team to join us at 320 every day in prayer. He said, what's significant about 320 p.m.? It's symbolic because of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, which I just quoted, that our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything we could ever ask or imagine. It's no coincidence then that we're experiencing this miracle that's unfolding with this facility. It's no accident. It's no coincidence that this is happening. You know why it's happening? It's happening because the word of the Lord to us is that there is more. And if it's happening for us corporately, collectively as a church, God also wants to do it for you individually in your life. And what needs to happen though, is that you need to, God needs to uh, help us enlarge, here it is, our capacity to receive it. Sometimes you need to make room in your heart for the miracle. And the stretching you experience in the middle, that part of your life, that season of your life that seems to make no sense is the stretching. Come on, somebody. The stretching that precedes the miracle because God has to allow us to build our capacity to receive it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you ever wondered what that season was about, that season of wax on, wax off. Hmm? Paintbrush up, paintbrush down. Those moments when Mr. Miyagi's instructions to Daniel San made absolutely no sense. When God was saying things to you and allowing you to experience things that made no sense, it was God's way of preparing you for the miracle, enlarging your capacity to receive it. And that's why Oliver Wendell Holmes said it this way, a man's mind once stretched by a new idea will never return to its original dimensions. Did y'all hear that? When God begins to stretch your mind with a new idea, a new dream, a new possibility, your mind will never, can never return to its original dimensions. So just this week, last week, Pastor Wendy and I were in Las Vegas. The Lord had us in environments, listen to me, that enlarged my capacity to receive, that enlarged my capacity to believe. Listen to me, if one man named Elon Musk, if one man named Jeff Bezos can send people into space, I ain't talking about an entire federal space program, one man's dream moving people from this atmosphere outside of Earth atmosphere, Earth, Earth's atmosphere, one man. Is it possible that maybe you and I have been thinking 
and dreaming too small. When God has given us three words, there is more. I walked into the headquarters of Tryon Supercars in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I sat across from the CEO and chief designer of Tryon Supercars. He walked us into the showroom, and sitting in the showroom, Pastor Jesse, was a, a $1.5 million supercar that this guy and his company are building. Listen, when you see the tech, <laughs> when you see, and listen, this is a guy who worked for GM, and a lot of his technologies were stolen with no credit. His name doesn't appear on any of the patents. Who worked for, uh, 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 I just said his name, Elon Musk. What car does he, Tesla? That a lot of the technologies in the Tesla were developed by him. No credit. And then one day he just decided, you know what? I'm going to just do my own thing. Hmm? And so his car, the Tryon Nemesis, RR, RR meaning race ready, 2,000 horsepower, zero to 60 in two, come on somebody. I want to say 2.5 but two or 2.8. Listen, if you see the technology on the thing, and I'm sitting there and this guy's talking about the dream in his heart. You know his next thing? Space. And I'm sitting across from a guy who's only a few years older than I am. And not only has he built a supercar, not only does he have a whole line, listen to me, a whole, here it is, a whole line of electric muscle cars that will be coming out this year. He's already thinking about going to space. And I started saying to myself, why am I in this room? Yeah. Yeah. And then it dawned on me, Trey. The reason you're in this room, Ray, is because there is more. There is more beyond what you have seen. There is more beyond what you have imagined. And the Lord was enlarging my capacity to receive. While we are grateful for this ongoing 7.5 miracle with this building, the Lord is already saying, Ray, there is more. Come on, I thought you would be a little bit more excited than you are. No, no. I want you, I want you to, to check uh, that hesitation you feel. Hmm? Yeah, some of us, in, in our mind, we're doing, the, we're doing the math, right? It doesn't compute that God could do something like that for me. That God could do something bigger than what I'm experiencing right now. And part of my assignment this morning is to prime the pump. To raise your level of expectation. And that's why Ralph Waldo Emerson said, every man. Without exception, every man, every woman has a greater possibility. And sometimes you have to see your greater possibility before you can seize your greater possibility. Are you with me? There is more. Listen, I was around... I was a, listen, I'm not saying this to brag or boast. I'm just saying that sometimes God is gracious enough to put you in certain environments, in certain atmospheres, in certain places that will make you say, what on earth am I doing here? But the reason you're there is, well, two things. The reason you're there is because God wants to enlarge your ability to believe and to receive. But most of us pervert it and make it an opportunity to be jealous or envious or to compare. I said, well, God, why you ain't do that for me? No, the reason I put you there is so you can see the possibility. Not to covet or envy what someone else has. Are you with me? There is more. 
Say that with me. There, there is more. Now, this is what the scripture says. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Right now in this room, as God's word is being spoken and declared, faith is rising in some of your hearts. You're already starting to see how you will scale your business. You're already starting to see how you will do things differently. You're already starting to see how God will give you creative and innovative ideas to do things not only differently, but to do them better. Because the Lord said there is more. So here we are in Luke chapter number five, beginning at verse one, where we started, where we started uh, this year. We're going to revisit our anchor text, our foundational text for this year, 2022. It was for more than just a series. I felt like I needed to revisit the text. Do there is more 2.0. So here it is. Scripture says, so it was, verse 1, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But... The fishermen had gone from them, and they were washing their nets. Context is that they had put in a full night's work, and they had come up short. They had caught nothing. What I like about these verses is the fact that Jesus saw their situation. Jesus saw them washing their nets. Jesus saw that their effort had not yielded the expected return. I just like those two words, Jesus saw. May I submit to you this morning, Converge Nation, that Jesus sees you? That Jesus sees you in the place where you are? Not only in your successes, but even more importantly, in your struggles? Because we have this thing where we think that, oh, if life is going the way I anticipated, the way I expected, then God is with me. And somehow, magically, when things are a little bit hard, then he's abandoned me. When nothing could be farther from the truth. Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Psalm 46 and verse 1 says that God is an ever-present help. Always there, especially in our time of trouble. Right now, for those of us who are struggling to believe that there is more because you see your empty nets. How do you dream beyond what's in your hand? When you look down at all of your efforts and all of your work and everything is empty nets. Yet God says from that place, I want you to dream beyond. And the first reason you and I can dream beyond and enlarge our capacity to receive is, number one, because we know that Jesus sees. Jesus saw them washing their nets. Ah, verse 3 picks up. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. Somebody say, the inconvenience, all right, let's try that one more time. The inconvenience of obedience. This is where most of us miss God. Because you've already been on the water all night. You already washed your nets. And then he says, take this boat out there because I need it. Hmm? I'm talking about the breaking points of your life and my life when God says, do it again. And it not only makes no sense, it is incredibly inconvenient. Because every time you bring that boat out the water, you got to wash it down. Every time you bring the, you got to take out all the weeds and God's let, Ray, I need you, but Lord, I'm tired. No, I need you right now. Lord, I just washed the nets. Ray, I need your boat. Lord, I got nothing left to give. 
I'm talking about the inconvenience of obedience. When God says, I want you to take up once again the thing that you gave up on. The inconvenience of obedience. They had washed their nets. They had toiled all night. Listen to this. It was bedtime. They were about to go night-night. And Jesus said, before you go night-night, let me disrupt. Let me interrupt your plans. I wonder how many of us have made room in our lives for divine disruptions. For sovereign agitation. For God to stir some things up. Now, nah, Lord, listen, if you wanted to get in this boat, you should have come when we were fishing. <laughs> Not when we we're about to go to bed. And some of us miss the move of God because we despise anything that inconveniences us. And God is like, if you only knew what was on the other side of your obedience. If you only knew what was on the other side of this inconvenient ask. Are y'all listening to me? There is more. I saw the text picks up. <laughs> in verse, um, in uh, verse, well, verse 3, it says, and Jesus sat and taught the multitudes from the boat. You know what they did in that moment? They gave Jesus something that was theirs that now became a platform for him to do ministry. What if, what if the thing that you have been struggling with that you thought was just a means of income and revenue, God says ought to be a platform for me to reach more people. Listen to me, sometimes we struggle in life, not because of a lack of effort, but because of the wrong approach. It's not that you're not working hard, you're approaching it the wrong way. And Jesus says, this boat and these nets have not produced the return you desired. But if you'll let me in the boat, if you will let me in the boat of your life and allow this boat to become a place where I reach hurting people, you will experience the more that is on the other side of this momentary inconvenience. Most people in their lives, they don't even consider Jesus in their work life. They don't consider Jesus in their family life. Jesus is only something that some of y'all do on Sunday mornings. And Jesus said, the reason life ain't working is because you haven't let me in the boat. The only time you allow me to have access in your life is for an hour and a half on Sunday mornings. And God forbid the service go two hours. Yet Jesus says, I want to get in your boat. I want to get in your family. I want to get in your finances. I want to get in your relationships. I want to get in your business. And how many of us even consider God when we're making decisions? And that's why Proverbs said, in all your ways, acknowledge him. How many of us, even before we make a move, before we make a decision, even acknowledge God and invite him to be a part of the process and ask his counsel. And Jesus said, let me in the boat. Most of us are just comfortable with Jesus being on the beach. Y'all hear that? We want to be close enough to Jesus without him getting in our boat to tell us what to do with it. I'm good, Jesus, as long as you're on the beach with me. Just don't get in my boat. 
And how many of you realize you cannot get God's results doing things your way? And that's the problem with culture. We have a Burger King mentality that you can have it your way. We have a Nordstrom mentality that the customer is always right. And sometimes God wants to disrupt that. So Jesus gets into the boat. Notice what it says. He sat down. And he taught the multitudes from the boat. Now we said this at the beginning of the year that the, the Jesus ministry was based in Capernaum. And Capernaum is one of the lowest places geographically on the face of the earth. I think that there is a natural and supernatural correlation that the place where Jesus spent 70 to 80% of his ministry was a low place. Last week we talked about how Jesus started his ministry in Nazareth. And the testimony of Nazareth was, can anything good come out this place? Not only is that where he started his ministry, that's where he grew up. And when he started his ministry, he didn't go to the most affluent and most influential part of Israel or Jerusalem. He went to Capernaum, a low place. And from this low place, he sits in a boat and begins to teach the multitudes of broken people. But here's the rest of the story. Because immediately after Jesus ended that Bible study, <laughs> verse 4, notice what it said. When he had stopped speaking, the moment Jesus said, amen, I'll see y'all next week for Converge Live. <laughs> as soon as Chad and the worship team got on stage and y'all were exiting the building, notice his first priority. Hmm? He's like, oh, wow, Peter, you let me in your boat to do what I needed to do. And here's the deal, man. The way I roll, ain't nobody going to outgive me. Hmm? Ain't nobody going to outdo me. And in return, for allowing me to use your boat. Here's what you get. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? Last week we talked about it, Matthew 6, 33. He said, seek first my kingdom and all these things will be added. And so what he was saying to Peter, because you put me first, here's what's going to be added to your life. The things you were struggling and striving for that you couldn't do in your own strength because you let me in your boat. That wayward child that you couldn't turn around. That diagnosis that the doctors can't fix because you let me in the boat. Here's what you get in return. Hmm? Here it is. When he had stopped speaking, verse number four, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep <laughs> and let down your nets for a catch. May I submit to you that what God desires to do next in your life, he cannot and will not do in shallow places. Hey, listen, here's the problem with most of us. After we failed, after we failed, the hardest thing to do, and I've heard this from, from, from professional boxers. They talk about the hardest thing to do is to prepare for the comeback. Because you're not as strong as you were. You're not as agile as you were. You're not as fit as you were. You don't have the stamina you used to have. You don't have the reflexes you used to have. And the hardest thing, listen to me, after failure is getting back in the fight. Yet the Lord says, where I'm going to take you next ain't going to happen around the shore. In spite of your failure, and it may be fresh. 
Right? It was the morning after. He said, you just messed up. You just failed. You just lost all that money. Your business just went under. But because you put me in the boat, I want you to do it again. And I don't just want you to tiptoe into this thing. I want you to launch out into the... You know why? Because this time I'm in the boat. Because this time I'm in the boat with you. Are y'all with me? I'm talking about your next level. I'm talking about dreaming beyond what you have in your hand. I'm not talking about being reckless. I'm not talking about irresponsible, being irresponsible. I'm saying just because you don't have it doesn't mean you can't believe for it. We've gotten away from that as the church. That if we didn't have the budget for it, we just didn't do it. And that has been the extent of our faith. But I still remember a time 20, 30 years ago that if you didn't have it in your hand, it was an opportunity for you to believe God for it and trust him until he did it for you. We've been on that journey many years. And even though we didn't have it in our hand, we believed God that God would do it. And he is. And the Lord's word to you is, are you willing to launch out into the deep? Just go a little bit further than your comfort zone. Because nothing fruitful or productive ever happened in your comfort zone. Are y'all with me? Shallow places. No, like for real, y'all gonna think I'm joking. But like for real, I haven't even gotten to my notes for this morning. Like for real, for real. No, I promise you, I have not. Am I lying, Jewel? Right, I see Shavonda said, I'm looking at him. You ain't lying. It, my notes are on you version, the Bible app. I see Wilhelmina says, yes, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every, I just messed up all your lunch plans. That's the inconvenience of obedience, though. No, I won't, I won't, I won't keep you much longer. I'll edit my notes. Come on. Thank you, Lo. I appreciate it. So he says, launch out into the deep. Not a shallow place. All in. Why? Because I'm in the boat. Verse 5. But Simon answered and said, hey, let me just do this. Let me get to my notes. Let me get to my notes while I work this. Eh? Let me just get to my notes. Uh, we... In this journey of faith, and in this story, what I see is what is common to men. When I say men, I mean men and women, co common to humanity. Because we process life through these four filters. Mm -hmm. These four filters that can negatively impact or activate our faith. Mm? It can either shut you down or it will stir you up. Y'all ready for these four filters? They're all in this story. Number one, the first filter that we often use to process life is a filter called failure. Our failures often determine what we're willing to do next. And so... These men had toiled all night and caught nothing, so now they're washing their nets. And sometimes, when we fail, the response is, I'm just going to quit. I'm going to give up on the dream. In fact, I looked up one, one definition of failure, and it was pretty harsh. <laughs> At least when I read it, it says lack of success. It's like, man, that's rough. Have you experienced a lack of success in a certain area of your life? 
Maybe you weren't successful at parenting. Maybe you weren't successful at marriage. Maybe you weren't successful at business. Maybe you weren't successful at entrepreneurship. How do you recover from that? Most people just quit and give up trying. That's where Peter was. We've told all night. And we've caught nothing. I think God wants us to confront our response to the failures in our lives. Because if we're not careful, we'll get stuck in the last thing that didn't go right. Y'all need to hear that. There's a whole lot of people stuck in their last mistake and their last failure. Can I tell you why? There's something about failure that if we don't process it correctly, we can live in a never-ending cycle of guilt. And guilt always says, I owe you. I mean, honestly, what's the difference between Judas betraying Jesus and Peter denying him? Both were dismal failures. One sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. The other one denied any association with him. But these two men had very different responses to their failures. Y'all hear what I'm saying? One committed suicide because he couldn't get past his last failure. One went back to doing what he had always done. He went back to being a fisherman, and Jesus came to him and restored him. And not only restored him, he made him the head of the church. And I wonder what Jesus' response to Judas would have been if Judas had had a healthy response to his failure. I'm just throwing it out there for your consideration. So what do you do if you failed? Maybe we could take a cue from Henry Ford's playbook. Because Henry Ford said success. What did Henry Ford say? He didn't say success. Hold on. It's going to come back to me. Oh, this is what Henry Ford said. Ford said failure is simply an opportunity to begin again this time more intelligently. Mm -hmm. Because there's lessons learned from that past failure, from that past mistake. Mm -hmm. And most of you have seen the Churchill quote, that success is moving from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Is it possible that this morning, the there is more that God wants you to experience is on the other side of your last failure? And if what Churchill said is right, success is moving from one failure to the next without losing enthusiasm. I think that's so powerful because the word enthusiasm comes from two words, entheos, which means in God. that at the root of all enthusiasm is a man and a woman who is rooted in God. And the reason I can go from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm is because I am in God. Are you with me? We process life, life in four ways. Number one, our response to failure. You ready for number two? Second way we process life this can either uh, uh, activate our faith or steal our faith is our response to facts. Are y'all listening to me? The problem with faith is faith is often illogical. 
it stands in contradiction to the facts. But how many of you realize that facts are subject to change? What we call facts today are subject to change. So when I was growing up, it was a scientific fact established by astronomers that there were how many planets? Nine. How many planets are there today? Mm -hmm. Because facts are subject to change. Because what we call facts, limited by our finite knowledge. I don't care how many letters you got after your name. What you know is finite. Hmm? There was something called a seafaring or a navigational fact when everybody thought the world was. Until someone disproved that. Are you with me? And most of us limit what God can do to the facts that we have. When the truth of God always transcends facts. You'll hear that now. God's truth and the truth of God's word transcends natural facts. And that's why when we stand, when we have a promise from God that doesn't align with the facts we have in our hand, listen to me, baby, choose the truth. Because the truth of God's word cannot and will not change. I wish I had time to unpack it. That's why he said in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 12, so is my word that goes out of my mouth. I, he said, I watch over my word to perform it. That's what he said. I watch over my word to perform it, to bring it to pass. So what was Peter dealing with? Peter had to deal with the fact that they had toiled all night. That was a fact. Peter had to deal with the fact that now it was the middle of the day, which was the worst time to fish in the Middle East. And he's got to go out there and listen to Jesus, who's a carpenter, not a fisherman. And take the instructions of a fisherman over his own personal experiences. The thing that makes us stop oftentimes in our pursuit of what is more is the facts just don't line up. You know the first thing we heard when we started to pursue this building? No bank will give you a loan. Because the facts were, when you do the numbers, ain't no way it's going to happen. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Listen, when I'm saying this, I'm not just speaking words to you. The reason it's called a miracle is because it is humanly impossible and there is no factual explanation for it. And some of us has li have limited what God can and will do in our lives to the facts. Are you understand what I'm saying? Koketsu, can I put you on the spot? He says, sure, okay. Was it three years ago, maybe before COVID? You are believing God for a miracle in your physical body. Can you say what it was? He had an MRI done. And they found lesions on his brain, which points to multiple sclerosis. That was a Fact! What did you do? You know what Coquetso did? He subscribed not to the facts that the doctors presented him. He subscribed to the truth of God's word and began to take communion daily. Because communion, according to the word of God, is the meal that heals. How many of us will go to a doctor and the doctor say, 
multiple sclerosis is in your future. They said, well, I'm just going to take communion. <laughs> what did the doctor say when he went back to him? They did a second MRI. Found nothing. We don't play around with God's truth. We don't play around with God's truth. And most of us stop trusting God. Most of the people say, oh, yeah, the doctor said uh, I've got MS. And that's it. And this is what we do. We own it. We pet it. Oh, this is my little pet that I've got to live with for the rest of my life called MS. No, no, no. You stand on the truth of God's word that declares by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. That's the promise of God's word. Most of us stop believing God because of the facts. Number three, and I'm going to go fast and furious. Most of us stop believing God because of fear. Fear is a distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, evil, or pain. Notice what it says in that definition. Whether the threat is real or imagined. Yeah. If there's a lion charging at you, that ain't imagined, that is real. And the correct response is to get to safety as quickly as possible. But I would venture to say that most of us are held in a prison of fear by things that are not real, but by things that are imagined. That we made up in our own heads. And number four, because I'm going to let you go, the fourth thing that holds us captive is how we process the future how we think about the future. The future is simply defined as a time regarded as still to come at a later time, going or likely to happen or exist. And when most people think about the future, they don't think about good. They think about all the things that could go wrong. And the, the danger is most people don't understand that your outlook determines your outcome. It's a big deal. So when we say that there is more, God wants us to stir up faith in our lives personally to overcome our failures and those, how those failures hold us captive, to overcome our uh, 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 what was the second thing? Our fears. To overcome our concerns about the future so that we can experience all that God has planned for us. Notice, notice what happens in Luke chapter 4, and I promise you this is where I close. It says, but, when Simon ans but Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Facts. We toiled all night and caught nothing. He could have stopped right there and says, you know what? I'm going to process this situation based on the facts that I've worked all night and it's produced nothing. Yet all of us need to learn the power of this next word, nevertheless. Yeah. I got the doctor's report. There are lesions on my brain. Nevertheless, my God is a healer. He said, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Now he's dealing with his last failure because his last failure was I let down these nets all night and caught nothing. But I'm going to do it again. I've told y'all before <laughs> that Einstein is often credited with this paradigm, with this thought process, that the definition of insanity, Pastor Jesse, is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. I have learned in my walk with God that doing the same thing over and over 
in necessarily insanity when Jesus is in the boat. Sometimes doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result is the definition of faith. When God says to you, march around Jericho seven times and the sixth day, Malak, ain't nothing changed. But he said, go around a seventh time. That's faith. Culture calls it insanity. God calls it, calls it faith. Peter said, I just did this, Lord, and caught nothing. Nevertheless, this ain't insanity. This is faith to do the same thing again, expecting a different result because Jesus is in the boat. Yeah. That's why Naaman could dip himself in the Jordan, the dirty, stinky, filthy Jordan, the inconvenience of obedience seven times. What if he had quit on the sixth time and said, oh, well, Einstein said, this is the definition of insanity. Einstein's super smart. I'll just listen to what Einstein said over the foolishness of this prophet. And what if he had stopped on the sixth dip? How are you processing failure? How are you processing your last mistake? Luis, you can come. The band can come. Because I'm going to close right here. I'm going to close right here. I'm going to close right here. The power of this story, we think, is in the miracle of the net breaking, boat sinking catch. And I believe God will do that for some of us here who will dare to believe. In your life, beyond what you're experiencing now, he will give you a net breaking, boat sinking catch. Mm? Somebody say, why not me? Yeah. But here's the power. I don't want this to be lost on any of us this morning because the power of this story, thank you. There it is. There's that sound. The power of this story the power of this story is in verses 9 through 11. After the net breaking, boat sinking catch, this is what it says. And this has to do with how we process the future. This is what the scripture says. For he and all, this is Peter, for he, Peter, and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. So God gives Peter this incredible miracle. Not only, does, not only is Simon blessed, but everybody connected to him is blessed. That's the kind of miracle I want. Where it's not self-serving, but everybody connected to me comes up. Because of my willingness to press beyond my failure, beyond my fear, and beyond what I thought the future would look like. So here it is. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. That's how we deal with the future. The, the, the words, the phrase fear not appears in scripture 365 times. You think that's co coincidence? No, he's given us a fear not for every single day of the year. The way we deal with the future is we hold on to the word of the Lord that says, do not be afraid. But notice what he says, from now on, you will catch men. You will be a fisher of men. Notice verse 11. So when they had brought their nets to land, they forsook all and followed him. Hold on, you just blessed me with a net breaking, boat sinking catch. Hey, Mina, tell me it really wasn't about the fish? You mean to tell me that in that moment, after Jesus gave them what they had pursued all night, that they walked away from it? After he gave them the miracle, 
You mean to tell me the miracle wasn't about the stuff? That after they got the miracle, they walked away from it to follow Jesus? Yeah. Don't get it twisted. I don't care how much money you earn. I don't care how many businesses you build. I don't care how many houses and cars you own. I don't care how many luxury brands you wear. Don't get it twisted. He ain't doing it for that. He's doing it because of what's on the other side. The miracle is simply to get you to believe that if you follow him, there's greater side, greater on the other side of your obedience. And guess what? On the day of Pentecost, when the church was born, and Peter, who was at the center of this miracle, listen to me, preached his first sermon, and 3,000 people were saved. I guarantee you, he didn't miss not one fish. And I'm saying to you, you think what God is doing now, there is more, it's only about stuff. No, the only reason he did that for Peter was so that Peter could see that he was calling him to be a fisher of men. And that this same guy who, be, who denied him three times, this same loud mouth, easy to get angry, no self-control guy, would become the pastor of the church at Jerusalem. And he would preach a sermon. And in that first sermon, 3,000 people would be saved. And here it is. Whatever you're willing to walk away from will determine what God brings you into next. So, Father, I pray for our church. And I thank you, God, for the new thing you're doing in this house. But, Father, as you open doors as you elevate and promote your people, as you bless us, God, not only materially and financially, but as you bless every area of our lives. God, I pray that we would see you in the midst of it all. That it will not be about the stuff, but it will be about the Savior. And all the people, all the people, broken and hurting, the same people, Jesus, that you ministered to at Caper Capernaum. The same kind of people in low places. The same kind of people you ministered like the ones you ministered to in Nazareth. That's what you've called us to. That's who you've called us to. And the miracles are there to serve your purpose. Father, let us never miss that. Let us never miss that. There is more on the other side of our obedience. We thank you for it now, Lord. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Did I help anybody this morning? Come on, somebody. Praise the Lord. Dima, is that you? I thought that was you. I was looking for you earlier. Why don't you come up as we close the service? You can come. And is that, uh, is that uh, Oli, Ola? Okay, that's Amelia and Dominic. All right, why don't you guys come? Come on up, come on up. All right. So listen, part of what we're going to do, all right, we're going to bless this family and Dom, uh, uh, Dima, little Dima isn't here because little Dima is your translator, so I won't put you on the spot. Huh? But uh, listen, uh, Dima told me, Listen, I'm going to be in the Ukraine. This family is now your responsibility. And so guess what we're going to do? We're going to love on Dominic, and we're going to love on Amelia, and we're going to love on their mom while they're with us. Amen? Yeah. Because that's what we do. Здравствуйте. 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 All right. So... Oh, my bad. I'm sorry. I almost forgot about it. All right, fantastic. When, when are you going to Ukraine again? Oh, next month. Okay, so you extended it. Okay. 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 All right, so he said he's going to extend his trip. He'll probably leave in about a month. He's going to make sure they're settled before, they, before he goes. But they're with him now, but he's going to make sure they're settled. And we're going to be a part of that, okay? 
And uh, so I just wanted us to take a moment. Let's pray for them, man, because I know it's a big deal. New country, new language, new transition. You, you speak a little bit of English, right? A little bit? Okay. Do you want to say something? You're shy. How about Dominic? He speaks a little bit of English? Very little. Very little. Okay. Where's uh, mom? Where's all, all her? She's tired. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So mom's home. She's tired, and uh, but she'll probably be with us next week. Come on, Converge. Let's, huh? Next week. Okay, next week. Let's stretch our hands toward this beautiful family. In fact, why don't you stand? Because we're going to dismiss the service. Coquetso, you can come. Why don't you join me as we pray for uh, Dima and Dominic and Amelia and their family, okay? Father, we thank you uh, that you've called us to the kingdom for such a time as this. And Father, we thank you that your word says that we ought to be our brother's keeper. Father, I know personally, I know firsthand what it means to be a refugee, what it means to lose everything, what it means to have nothing and start all over again. So Father, as your church, as your church, we will be the kind of church that loves our neighbors well. Yeah, that loves our neighbors well. So thank you, Lord, for Dominic, for Amelia, and for giving them a new home in the United States. That God, of all the trauma from the war in Ukraine, that God, you would heal them, give them a fresh start and a new beginning. And I pray that right here at Converge, they will experience the love of God. They will experience firsthand the love of God. They will experience firsthand the love of God through his people, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Amen, amen, amen. Love you, Dima. Thank you. All right. Last thing I'm going to say, uh, next steps. Uh, many of you signed up for next steps. I think we have about five families that will be uh, taking this journey with us here at Converge. Man, we're excited about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and so immediately following the worship experience, uh, the ushers will be out there. They'll give you direction. I think we're going to meet in the, the youth room, which is just outside. So uh, again, thank you so much for being a part of this service today. There is more. Uh, last thing, beautiful couple back there. And I saw you guys walk in. And uh, thank you so much for coming. And uh, I'm going to make a beeline and love on you because I don't think we've met. But uh, we're so glad you're here this morning. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Go catch it. Um, yes, here we go. Um, and please don't forget uh, Mother's Day. Uh, invite a woman, invite a mother, invite a friend. Uh, and also graduation Sunday, which is going to be on the 15th. So on the 8th, uh, we're going to ce celebrate our women. And on the 15th, we're going to celebrate our graduates. So invite whoever you can to come join us for our service. Amen. Amen. All right. Let us uh, bless you. With hands lifted up to heaven. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Uh, may the Lord make his face to shine towards you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace in jesus name amen enjoy the rest of your week you make the blind man see you make the new